Hello there, I'm Lummy, and this is my favourite YouTube channel. So welcome to Thinking Deeply About Primary Education, the podcast that gives you a peek inside the minds of some truly inspirational teachers. This week, I'm joined by Christopher Such. Hello again. Neil Almond. Hello. Shannon Doherty. Morning. And Elliot Morgan. Good morning. And this time, we're going to have a special live edition of the podcast with a plan to dig and dive a little deeper into some of the things we've learned this year. But first, Chris, what are you reading for? Um, so this week, I've dived back into a book that I read a couple of years back that really intrigued me, that reminded me about some of the things I actually liked about my university degree. And it is, I've actually got it here. It's... Um, Theory and Reality by Peter Godfrey Smith. It is a fantastic introduction to the philosophy of science. For those of you that see people talking about positivism on Twitter, usually to try and shut down conversations about educational research um, or hear about Karl Popper or paradigm shifts and all these bits and pieces and want to know a bit more and why wouldn't you, I'd highly recommend the book. It is yeah, really, really accessible content. Oh, it has to be for me to be able to get something from it. But yeah, really enjoyed it. Um, what about you, Neil? What are you reading for? So given the current COVID situation, I'm placed in my bets that perhaps we will be asked to uh, teach online again, perhaps some point between now and February. So I'm looking at teaching in the online classroom by Doug Lamov. Uh, he just looks at ways that you can kind of implement some of the techniques that you might see um, or read and teach like a champion uh, and how you might be able to use those in the context of teaching online via synchronous or asynchronous learning. So something um, new for me because in my previous school, uh, we weren't asked to kind of uh, create videos or things like that for children. Uh, but I know in the school that I'm working with right now, they were asked to do it. So it's something that I need to kind of get my head around uh, just in case. Hopefully won't be needed, though, but just in case. Shannon, what are you reading for? Well, nothing quite as interesting as you guys so far. I am just fully embracing the Christmas holidays and reading whatever I can get on Kindle Unlimited of just trashy rom-coms and psychological thrillers, whatever will get, keep me going for a two hour soak in the bath. So I'm just taking a break and eating cheese and reading rubbish. What about you, Morgs? What are you reading for? Um, so I'm currently reading a book that um, Chris suggested in the Tadape Discord, the A Little History of the World. I've got it right here. I don't know if you can see it because the background, yeah. Um, it's just a beautifully written uh, and like over overly simplistic way of explaining a lot of ancient history well that, that's um how far i'm into the book but yeah a really really wonderful book um and i think it would make a sort of great class text albeit some things are a bit dated in in how they're said but with a mature year six class i'm sure it could be used very effectively what about you kieran what are you reading for um so at the minute not too much because i have been I think you're on mute not not on the stream i'm not elliot don't worry and um, <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I've been recording season four, so I've been reading too much recently at the minute. So I'm, I'm getting ready for sort of January Flower Brace podcast episodes. But um, I think I'm definitely going to save what you guys have uh, have come up with and, uh, you know, read those as the as the new year starts. So the focus of this episode continues the theme from Christmas Day, you know, as we take the time for some professional reflection and a closer look at some of the things that have helped us grow as teachers this year and um, sort of a pedagogical companion to the subject knowledge compendium perhaps um, and we're doing this live to add another dimension to the discussion so you know don't be afraid to share your thoughts and questions in chat you know whether you're watching on twitch or youtube um, and from today it's also possible to support the podcast using the link ko-fi.com forward slash tadapi and ko-fi is spelled k-o hyphen f-i 
and Tadape TDAPE. Um, and supporters are provided with access to episode transcripts, monthly CPD videos, and sort of other exclusive rewards. So I think, you know, definitely have a look. And essentially this model allows us to continue to improve the podcast while avoiding paid advertising because, you know, we recommend a whole lot of stuff on this podcast and my preference is, you know, for it to be sincere promotion above all else, you know. Um, and there's there's absolutely no expectation anyone does support us through Kofi, but if you choose to do so, thank you. Um, and I hope you enjoy the bonus content it opens up. Um, so that's enough for me. We're going to look at our standout book or paper from this year. I'm going to throw to you, Neil, first. What book or paper has really stood out when you've read it this academic, well, I suppose this calendar year? My choice this year was Prisoners of Geography by Tim Marshall. Uh, the reason it would stand out for me, it was probably the first non kind of edgy book, but still had some sort of reference and you could easily see how it would work into geography there, which as you say, the first time I've read a book like that, where I was like, okay, this is really interesting to the point that, you know, I recommend it to my dad and he's not a massive reader at all, but he does like geography. So I thought oh, that would be great for, for him to understand as well and to read to it to enjoy a little holiday read and I think that's kind of one of the reasons why it was kind of you know, a standout book for me is because it's very rare that I come across a, a book that I would read that I could also kind of recommend to a family member uh, who's obviously not not a teacher he's, he's retired and enjoying the, the retired life so it's yeah I really enjoyed the fact that I could uh, we both read it and we could share that together and there is that element of there being a, a really good book that Again, perhaps not for year five or year six, but certainly at, at a subject level uh, point of view for teachers, if you kind of want to understand the intricacies of human and physical geography and to kind of understand how these elements kind of interact with each other, uh, it's really worthwhile just kind of make those own connections in your own brain as well. So hopefully it can help support your own teaching of geography as well. But yeah, the main reason this was a standout for me was because it's something I could, uh, it's something that I read that I could share with the, uh, my family and discuss and talk about it afterwards yeah i i am um, i've just been given the follow-up to it was it power the power of geography and um, so i'm looking forward to get, getting stuck into that over the what, what remains of the christmas break you know and i think i i think i said in the podcast i didn't really understand word geography until i read you know the prisoners of geography because i sort of realized the connections between different parts of the world in a way that i hadn't really before what about you, Shannon? What's your standout book? Uh, so it took me so long to decide this, uh, but I went with Motivated Teaching by Peps McRae, which came out in September last year. And I read after Neil Armand uh, had read it. And I, it just blew me away. The way that Peps writes is so clever. And so it makes it so accessible. But it's one that I've dipped back to sort of all through the year when I've been having conversations with like early career teachers or other people in school, uh, senior leaders, things like that. And it's just one of those things where I just think everyone should read it. It gives you a really solid understanding of kind of the science behind motivation and kind of how we can move away from those ex ex extrinsic motivators, which I know that is quite heavily relied upon on, in primary. Um, so I would 100% recommend that people get on that book. Absolutely. Um, you know, I didn't read this year, but with 2017, that book was published? Yeah, I think I um, really enjoyed it at the time. And uh, there's a lot that we can take from it. What about you, Elliot? What have you gone for this year? What's your standout book or paper? Um, <clears throat> so my standout book is um, Organised Ideas by Oliver Coviglioli and David Goodwin. Um, it's a lovely book that sort of applies to all age ranges across education, whether it be you teaching EYFS or a university lecturer. It's got a, a nice mixture of um, theory and actual practice, like any good edgy book should do. And the sort of the central idea behind the book is making thinking visible and how we can organise ideas through um, graphic organisers. Um, although the, the authors prefer to call them word diagrams um, and how we can use those to support making our thinking as the teacher visible for for the learner during instruction um, it's all supported by cognitive science um, 
and it's just a wonderful book that enables students to see <clears throat> how knowledge should be organised. Um, I also second the books that um, Shannon and Neil mentioned because I've read both of those. Those are both amazing books as well. And I just treated myself to the to the sequel of the Prisons of Geography book for Christmas. Nice. Did we all see that talk by David and Oliver at Research Aid Surrey? Yeah, it was fantastic. I mean, I remember coming away thinking, yeah, this is definitely something I want to check out in future. And um, you know, a massive list of things to check out in future. But um, yeah, it was it was an impressive talk, and they only had so much time to think about what it, what it was that um, they could get across to us. So yeah, definitely recommend checking that out as well. And then Chris. What's your standout book or paper this year? I've gone for um, Harry Fletcher Wood's Habits of Success. Um, I had the pleasure of learning from um, Harry Fletcher Wood for a little while earlier in the year. And so I had the chance to see him put some of these ideas into practice. But even without that, um, if I go back kind of two or three years, I was a little bit interested in behavioral economics only to the extent that I usually get interested in things kind of quite a superficial level just reading lots of introductions to the subject but to read a book by someone who clearly has learned about behavioral economics to a really deep extent who has then thought about how that could be applied to education how there are lots of tweaks or um, nudges or slight changes in our behaviors that can potentially have a significant impact on um, outcomes in schools it, yeah, it was just an absolutely fascinating read. I, I would highly recommend reading that alongside something like um, Basic Instincts by Pete Lunn or any of the, or the work of um, Kahneman and Tversky, just as a, to get a little bit of background around behavioral economics as well. So, yeah, Habits of Success by Harry Fletcher Wood. An absolute, yeah, it's a great book. Well worth reading. Nice. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've obviously read Responsive Teaching and absolutely loved it and thought the way that information was sort of disseminated was really, really clear. And, you know, it, we could use it immediately in the classroom. And um, so, yeah, so definitely another one to check out as well. And um, so then we're going to think about the podcast next. And we're thinking about our favorite episode from the year and why. Um, now, I won't make, be making a judgment um, because it wouldn't be fair, because I think everyone has been fantastic and really generous and given me their time and their expertise and um, so let's see if we start with you Elliot you know what, what's been your favorite episode of the year and why so um, my favorite episode was uh, Matt Swain and Tom Gary I forget what the like the title of the episode was but it was along the ideas of supporting ECTs and t teacher development um, I think it might have been season two so a while back um, fairly early on in the year um but i found it particularly useful because at the time myself i was unemployed looking to go back into teaching into a leadership role where i was going to be supporting ects so i find it incredibly useful in, in that respect um but just the wealth of knowledge that tom and matt have um is is very very useful and i just listened the whole time feeling incredibly jealous that i don't work for step um because I'd love to be involved in, in the way they do things. It just sounds like they're doing everything right. Um, and it also made me incredibly jealous of ECTs. What a time to be just qualified. Um, and I, I know there's a lot of criticisms being aimed at the, uh, the ECF and everything, but if you listen to that episode, you can see how one set of schools really does it right. Nice. And Neil, obviously, you have um you've seen from the other side because you've moved to step since that episode haven't you and so you're almost um you're becoming the, the fifth beat i have <laughs> <laughs> yeah because I, I was talking to charlotte mckechnie about the team they've got there it really is a wonderful and um, sort of ecosystem they've built and i think yeah i think the timing in terms of the stuff they're doing and the ecf you know it, it couldn't be more perfect you know it's a match made in heaven i think so yeah it, certainly whenever matt shares his cpd with us you know i'm like wow i wish i was a a training teacher in the in these sessions you know so that yeah they're and they're both both lovely as well chris what, what, what about you what's your favorite episode and you can't say season two episode six reading <laughs> well, well i'm gonna have to think of a different one now then yeah <laughs> to be honest yeah that i wasn't gonna say that episode but now you've mentioned it like 
yeah, you've uh, basically changed a big aspect of my life single-handedly, Kieran, for that, and I've never really thanked you properly. So uh, anyway, uh, but putting that, that aside for a second, yeah, my um, the episode I went with uh, was uh, Lloyd Williams-Jones, um, Leverage and Leadership. I mean, firstly, obvious thing to say, but I could happily listen to Lloyd read out the phone book. <laughs> His voice is like caramel. A little bit of a man crush is probably a fair way of putting this. But we're pals, so he'll forgive me saying that. Um, but beyond that, to hear someone who is, excuse the expression, but like at the coal face, who has become a deputy head and has grown as a deputy head under possibly the most challenging circumstances that I can imagine, who has approached that if you listen to the podcast that that with a sense of ambition and humility and to talk through all of the different ways that he sought to empower those around him it's yeah I've never been a deputy head I, I feel like it's a real thing that I'd like to do at some point um and more so having listened to that episode it's I'm not easily inspired um but I felt that that was a genuinely inspiring conversation and something that I will go back to, I imagine, time and again. Yeah, and the, the difference in Lloyd in terms of his own personal confidence between episode one and that episode was massive. You know, he was he was totally in charge. And then on subsequent sort of appearances in the in the pre mid season chats, and um, you know, he, he's absolutely smashed it. So yes, a massive well done to Lloyd. He just needs the, the inspectors to call so he can sort of get that off his back and then focus on you know taking the school even further you know because it's a uh, it's it's quite a stressful place to be isn't it when you're expecting the call but um also in the middle of a pandemic as well and um, so who haven't we who haven't we asked about their favorite episode shannon do you want to go <laughs> thank you um i firstly before i start talking about my favorite episode i have to agree with everything you both said about lloyd honestly that episode it <sighs> It just felt so good to listen to for someone who's just on the ground doing school improvements so solidly. Um, and he's so reflective. It, he's like my, um, he and Neil Armand are my deputy head goals. Um, but my favourite episode, I have to say, I think was John Hutchinson, which was season three, episode six. And I mean, if you go and see John talk at like a research head, it's just incredible the stuff that they're doing at the reach foundation like he's amazing and listening to him talk about instructional coaching and talk about um the cradle to career that they have going on which just kind of blew my mind uh he's just someone that I'm like oh I want to go and sit down and, and have a drink with you and really pick apart your your whole ethos and how you've got to where you are because I can imagine that there was you know probably hours of content that he could have said in that episode but you know you don't want to do a six hour podcast um or, although I could probably listen to six hours of Siddhartha at the weekend um I just think John was incredible I think he he's got his finger on the pulse you know he's he's really sensible methodical about the things that he's doing and um the idea of setting up a school from scratch kind of brings me so much joy and I would just love to do what they've done myself so I think, yeah, I remember tweeting about it and and then going to see him at Research Ed and saying to him, it was just incredible. The stuff they're doing, it's awe-inspiring. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I, I tried to speak to him, but the, uh, like you said, after his session, he was, he was quite busy um, you know, because lots of people wanted to speak to him, didn't they? You know, but it, and I think, sorry, it was just after we'd recorded or released the episode. And I was like, yeah, you know, it was... You know the way that those two married up was really good as well because like, you know every time I listen to John speak or read what he he writes, you know I, I feel like I learn a whole lot and you know yeah and like I say he was extremely generous to give me quite a bit of his time um and yeah one you know a very very strong sort of contender for episode of the episode of the year and um, I think before we jump to you Neil I'm going to acknowledge that Lloyd has been texting me saying that the the frames per second might be a little sketchy. Um, I'm getting messages on my computer that say that 98% or 98.9% of the frames are being skipped. But then um, the whole point of this episode is really to make Saturday's episode, which the audio track for this will be, um, as easy as possible. So if it's unbearable, you know, don't feel you need to sit and watch. You know, so Lloyd, if you are thinking I can just listen to this tomorrow, 
then uh, you know that that's absolutely fine because this will be audio nine o'clock on New Year's Day. You know, so something to get rid of the sore head with. Um, so Neil, what's your favorite episode and why? So my favorite episode was one I think one of the early uh, in between season episodes where it's just those conversations. How do you solve a problem? Like which obviously. I think it's one of my kind of favorite parts of this podcast is are those little, how do you solve a problem? Like, and then to kind of talk, you talk about it for 45 minutes to an hour. And I really enjoyed the, how do you solve a problem? Like number lines, uh, that conversation between you and Chris, just because you, um, you did take kind of you know, diametrically opposed kind of views as to when the number line should be interested, um, should be introduced. And to be honest, I've personally i've never spent more than two or three minutes thinking about whether i should use a number line or not so the idea that you managed to you know really think that deeply about when a number line should be introduced was just one of those ones where yeah i'd probably need to listen uh, again to it and just take some notes um and really kind of think about where i um put myself on that um spectrum as to where you know something is simple and every day is the number line um you know, should be introduced it was really was just a, such a, a fascinating uh chat and i know then you can take that even you know, further i'm sure you probably did you know when should we have a number line that then introduces negative numbers i think i recall uh, a podcast or a, a kind of stream with um at all and mark mccourt where i think mark's position was um you know oh yeah and, you know, negative number line negative numbers on a number line you know pretty much you know straight away let's not deny their existence so yeah, just really interesting how you just took one resource as humble and as simple as the number line and then really kind of extrapolated every possible reason as to why you should use it by a certain point and why you shouldn't use it at a certain point. It really um, yeah, made me think a lot deeper about other kind of things in the classroom as well. That um, Yeah, really made me think more. So yeah, appreciate that conversation between you two. Really, really like that one. Yeah, that was a bit of a turning point because we sort of realized what was possible with the in-between episodes. And also that we realized that Chris and I could disagree and uh, it not be a massive deal. Because actually, I think <laughs> that's when our richest conversations come is when we are opposed. Because, you know, we could do a 20-minute episode where we both agree on absolutely everything or where all of us agree on everything. But, um, yeah, so that, that was a game changer. And, and like you, Neil, it, it's one of my favorite aspects. And I think it's, it's definitely, you know, as we go forward, the direction of the podcast will probably go more often than not because uh, because i think yeah it allows us to really think about the minutiae of our our role which is what we're we're all about and um, so leading on from that favorite response to a question and why and um, let's see where, where will i go first does anyone have a burning desire to answer this question immediately shannon do you want to go so uh, we re-listened to Andrew Jeffrey's episode together, Neil Armand and I, um, recently, mainly because we knew that it was just pure gold and everything he said was fantastic. And so he could have probably got all of his answers nominated for favourite response to a question. Um, but when you said to him, how do you approach planning in the long and short term? And he said, well, long term you know the law says it's here's the national curriculum and that's what you do uh and then he talks about the thing that i think so many people forget or don't know and he said it in his episode that it's only suggested in year groups and that you can sh kind of shift it around in key stages and that nugget of information for some teachers could have been a complete game changer for their practice and for some maths needs as well even some head teachers there, there were people who just aren't aware of that because they're so used to doing what the curriculum prescribed in each of those year groups. Um, so I think that was just like gold standard answer. And then he just goes on to give more great advice about teaching time and money in key stage one and, and then just more and more gold. And I just think anyone who, you know, is a new maths lead, an experienced maths lead, just struggles with teaching maths, just listen to his episode. Because all of those answers could have been my favorite response to a question, I think. Yeah, Andrew's brilliant, you know, and he, and he just sort of, his passion for maths, you know, is unsurpassed, you know, he's living and breathing his passion for maths, and yeah, I remember, I learned quite a lot, you know, I think I know a bit about maths, but when you listen to someone like Andrew talk, you're like, oh my goodness, you know, still so much to learn. Elliot, what about yourself? What was your favourite response to a question? 
So um, my favorite response came from uh, Gaia Reigns um, episode. <clears throat> And it was um, one of the classic questions that you have in the in sort of the earlier series, where um, you just ask about somebody's journey as a teacher. Um, and he went into depth about how he sees his career. Sorry, just living in London—that's what it's like. Just plenty of sirens going past. Um, yeah. So my favorite my favorite response was uh, Gar Rain's uh, response to his journey as a teacher, and he um, framed it as he sees his career as pre and post twenty fifteen. Um, and that's something that sort of really resonated with me because that's sort of how I view my career as well. Not that same year, but just seeing myself as before I sort of engage with evidence and post engaging with evidence. Um, just a really, really interesting answer. And, and his just whole career is really interesting. So I definitely recommend listening to that episode. Yeah, he's, he's inspirational, Gareth. And to think that he took over a school during the start of the pandemic and still managed to drive the school forward is, you know, you. you you know, it's hard to explain how impressive that is. You know, every time I talk to Gareth, you know, I learn something new. And, you know, he's, he's really driving things forward in Wales. And, you know, look forward to seeing him in, in March for Research at Cymru too. Um, yeah, so that'll be fantastic. Yes, I totally agree. Um, Neil, what was your favourite response to a question? Not as um, serious as the other uh, answers so far. But I just particularly enjoyed uh, Lloyd's answer to um, the question, where did it all go wrong with regards to uh, uh, book scrutiny? And I just think he summed it up perfectly in two sentences, which was that there was a fetish to make books look sexy, summative things. And I do not think there is a place for that in schools. And I just, yeah, that just summed up that episode as, and summed up that question just you know perfectly that's where it all went wrong they became sexy summative things which just aren't needed yeah, and you, it's, it's not, not how we it's not how we do things it's not how we prove learning to line managers or things like that it's not how we i know there are some people that do take notes in the podcast but i'm sure there are people who learn just as much if not more when they kind of just listen to it yeah i don't understand why we use those as proof of that's what a, a child's learned where you know we know learning versus performance just because they've performed well in that lesson doesn't necessarily mean that they can then go into remember it yeah and you, you say not that serious but actually lloyd just delivered it, the message with a bit of sugar to help it sort of go down a little bit easier didn't he and um, and then chris what was your favorite response to a question i'm gonna be a bit um naughty here and suggest too um first gareth metcalf and uh, when we talked uh, about problem solving and um, we were trying to get to the bottom of what it is um the discussion between you two um about what is and isn't a problem and the fact that i came away from that realizing that in mathematics it's o it's okay to recognize that people use the word problem for um, with different definitions, two specific definitions, one that seems to allow for the idea of um, routine problem solving and one that Gareth and I, for example, tend to subscribe to, which would make the idea of routine problem solving a bit of a contradiction in terms. But coming away from that and knowing if someone said to me, OK, so what is a problem in mathematics? And knowing that I now have a way to describe that succinctly you know, starting as I do with many, many sentences with the phrase, well, it depends because. So yeah, it's, um, I, I loved that, that conversation. I loved the clarity that you and Gareth gave to that without, you know, without necessarily dumbing it down for me to understand. It was spot on. Um, but I, I have to mention um, a response that Neil gave. Um, I think um, Mrs. S teaches, Victoria did as well in the episode in, on history specifically because in the question where you asked about what things perhaps might not be a good idea to do, I'm not going to go through all of the um, responses that were given, but things like um, not kind of using kind of ethical questions and considering them as historical inquiry, because frankly, this was about a week before I pushed my history curriculum stuff online. And following that episode, I just thought, oh, okay, I've got to change quite a lot of things in my history curriculum quite quickly. Uh, and so, yeah, he saved my, he and Victoria saved my bacon to some extent on that one. So, 
yeah, great episode and great set of responses. The, the, the classic Chris Such re-edit <laughs> that you're so fond of <laughs> engaging with. Um, yeah, that, that, that Gareth episode was probably the toughest one to prepare for because some of the ideas aren't necessarily widely accepted. Um, but I think you know it was the first of hopefully will be a few episodes and Gareth very kindly said he'll come back and join us for those and we'll really hopefully over the next year get under the under the skin of problem solving. Um, I, I have a favourite res- uh, sort of response in terms of me because I said during season two, episode six, that the art and science of teaching primary reading would be as important a book as why students don't like school. And I would just like credit for being the oracle on that one because, <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, it has surpassed, you know, certainly all of my output. And I think it is rightly acknowledged as, um, you know, a book that all teachers, whether primary or secondary, you know, they must read. And, you know, a big massive congratulations, Chris, because, I, you know, it must have taken an awful lot of editing, you know, because I know how lean you like your writing to be. Um, but, yeah, but it, it is absolutely perfect. And, you know, and, you know I, I'm joking about the fact that I was predicting it. But, um, you know, I think it needs to be acknowledged that it is a very important book. Um, so moving away from the podcast thinking about how our practice has changed this year. Neil, how, how have you changed as a practitioner in 2021? So certainly now it's 2021, so it's from September 2021, uh, deputy headship lead um, role in a school. So I'm able to have a far more operational strategic side of regarding everything that I kind of do in the school and that's really quite nice so all the things that um, we talk about on these shows or things that I've kind of thought the way that I think it should be done it's far easier I wouldn't say it always happens because you know there are certainly times when myself and my head of school have um, you know, argued and kind of different points to where we think things should go and I think that's probably healthy for an SLT to have that uh, that tussling um, between ideas and directions. I think that's a, a healthy thing to have. So certainly being able to implement new things has been uh, really exciting and kind of really thinking about how introducing certain things impacts then other things and you know, things inevitably get dropped if you try to influence and change uh, too much. So it's kind of been aware that, yes, I have all of these uh, ideas of where things want to go but actually you know being a good leader is actually restraining that urge to not throw everything away but to kind of you know put those things that you think will make those improvements it's so important I've learned to walk that school walk those corridors uh, we're fortunate enough that the the, the environment that we have in our school is one is such where um, any teacher at any time is free to kind of walk into any classroom at any point. Um, so you can kind of really take the temperature um, of what's going on in that classroom, um, get that picture then across the whole school and kind of really, um, as Lloyd would say, you know, pull those levers that are most needed to be pulled at that particular time. So that's certainly something that um, I've enjoyed from that leadership perspective. Uh, being a wonderful entry school, I also have a bit of a, a teaching commitment, so it's you know really good fun to uh, you know almost you know talk the talk and walk the walk. And so this year, particularly um, with regards to maths, I've been doing lots of uh, quiz and air rod stuff with um, our year six children, just because. I think we've lost Neil. You don't know if his video is still there, so perhaps he'll um, be back in a second. And um, yeah, does does that match up with anybody else's experience? I know Elliot, you've taken on uh, sort of a more leadership role when you've returned to school. You know, how does that match up with what you've learned this year? Yeah, yeah in a um, sort of similar position to what Neil's done, I've been uh, leadership since uh, September twenty one in a new school. Um, I think Neil was teaching class for us. I'm mostly office-based as well as having teaching allocation. 
Um, so, I, yeah, it's been interesting learning sort of more of the strategic and operational side of things, um, especially alongside Din and MPQH, looking into like budget management and, and health and safety and policy and so on. Um, but I, I mean, my practice, I sort of every other week have an existential crisis because I'm only covering a maternity leave for a year. So I'm like, how much impact can I really have? I'm bringing in this thing and that thing, but I'm not going to be here to see it through. Um, and I suppose that's the biggest impact that's had on me is slowing down. It's just going, right, I only have a year, so let's slow it down. Do, let's do less things, but let's do those things better. Um, so a huge part of my practice has been on reducing workloads um, and, and trying to slow down how many things I've brought in. And that was heavily influenced by um, Matt Swain and Lloyd William Jones, their talk at Research Ed, where they talked about how to structure CPD and how the average school might use every different staff meetings as a different thing to introduce um, and they sort of presented like let's show one thing and let's make that the thing for the next six weeks or, or whatever it may be that's really influenced my practice um, and helped me to just introduce a few things um, like how to line up outside the classroom or um, what tasks you have for pupils when they enter the classroom things like that very minor um, nuances and slight changes to practice but allowed those to really embed well and become more effective Nice. Yeah, sorry to cut you off there, Neil. Um, you sort of disappeared from the from the screen for a second. And so I was just asking Elliot right, right. Um, how his experience matched up with yours. You know, um, was there anything else you wanted to add before we sort of? Uh, I'm not sure at what point um, froze, froze, but just to say, she's, um, she's an air rods you were talking about when you froze. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the opportunity, I say, judging going from the. Uh, talk that you had about key stage manipulatives. I've written a lot about how quiz and air rods uh, can and definitely should be used um, in key stage two. So it's been uh, really useful just to have a kind of prolonged set of time um, where I can kind of put these things into practice, refine my thinking and have a look at what works. Um, not to kind of plug my own um, blog or any such, but it's kind of an area that I'm really kind of interested in um, blogging about is, you know, how do you teach certain objective and kind of look at in depth about um how one can teach this particular objective um which i think is really useful i just want to mirror what elliot just said as well um i too am on a, a maternity contract for one year and it really is something that does stay in the back of your mind when you're thinking about uh, teacher improvement and uh, leadership is that yeah you as far as you know you're only going to be there for a year so you have to really think about well what is that tangible impact that i can have because that kind of changes your mindset so you know you know you're probably not going to have that five-year impact it's, you know what can i just do for one year to kind of put these um put this school uh in a direction that you think is right or that school think is right for that time um, and i think that's quite a challenge as well so yeah just echo what elliot said there yeah so you're, you're almost getting a feel for the almost the other side of school leadership, you know, the, the stuff that we don't necessarily talk about in the podcast because we like to talk about pedagogy and teaching and learning quite a bit, you know, but that operational side and, and how you can have an impact, you know, it, it matters just as much, you know, and I think um, both your schools will be, you know, if, if it's what you want, will be have, have a, the awareness that, um, you know, you guys are, are people that need to keep on board as much as possible, you know, and I suppose the same goes for everybody on, on this call at the minute. Um, so, Neil and Elliot, Shannon, what have you learned this year? Uh, picking up from what the boys have said, so leading wise, um, definitely it's slowing it down, being cautious, realising that it's not a race to get things done and implemented and that school improvement is like a marathon and not a sprint and all of that stuff. It's about um, prudence, as Lloyd would, would say, from our MPQ stuff it's recognizing what's going to have the biggest impact yes i might want to change how something is done in the foundation subjects but is there a bigger need to change how we do phonics for example thinking about what what needs to be done first rather than what i just like the sound of um and with regards to my role across the trust i'm really learning about this sort of like change management kind of side of school improvement and different pockets of people who have different experiences and different ideas and opinions about how things should be done 
making sure you're giving people enough chance to explore and find their feet and sort of flirt with the ideas you're implementing, but also making sure that it's a bit more directed as well and that we're getting out of it what we want to get out of it. Um, so that's been a real learning curve for me. I've only been doing that bit for a term, so that's been interesting. Um, and teaching-wise, uh, it's funny you mentioned the, the success of Chris's book because teaching-wise, the one thing that has changed in my teaching practice has been my reading teaching. Very fortunate to have Chris as a friend, so I didn't have to wait for his book to come out to learn about the, the ways that he suggests we teach reading. And, um, you know, I, I taught year two last year and I had 92% um, pass for the phonics check in autumn. And I remember coming, I think I sent it to Neil and said, this is amazing, I've smashed it. Um, but, but there's so much more to come after that. And so, you know, when they were locked down for a couple of months, so, and so I knew very little reading was happening at home, and I knew I had to have a big impact when we came back in. And reading had to be the focus, and it has, and it has been the focus behind almost everything that happens in my classroom. I've always, I've always known it's important, but I don't think I really uh, put that into practice until kind of, kind of this, this podcast, talking to Chris, our, our, our friendship group, it's, it's been a real, real game changer for me. So these are things like the, the, the fluency reads, the extended reads, the fluency of that has each other, thinking about prosody, the things like, that like, I've always, I've always known and really never really knew how to implement. Um, um, and, the impact, and the impact like on my god last year, year was was incredible, incredible. and then and then this year this year with year five you know they're very they're really really, really, really impacted, impacted over the last, over the last um, um the years of years now and um, and um, and, um I, uh, I uh just like just like the, 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 the confidence has skyrocketed the fact that they're reading really, really out loud every day, every day. In front, in front of their class, their peers, peers, peers when you know that was a real, 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 real hurdle, real hurdle for, for it's all down, it's all down, down to Chris's to, book and, and, and having, having Neil at home, at home to, to, to about to about the time as well. well. He is also a very knowledgeable being. So that's how my my teacher's education has changed. Yeah, I'm almost a little jealous because I'll probably never teach anyone to read ever again. But I almost wish that then you know, 10, 15 years ago, I'd had access to Chris's book because then I probably would have done a much better job than, than what I did. Um, yeah, so it's quite exciting watching you guys share your experiences of putting those ideas into practice. Um, yeah, and I think actually on one of the YouTube videos, someone said, oh, we now talk about prosody in the in the staff room. I was like, that's brilliant, you know, because that's, that's changing the conversations that happen. It's, fantastic. it's yeah, super. Um, does that leave Chris then on how your practice has changed this year? Thank you for Thank you. saying Thank such kind things about my book. But I'd just like to quickly say that it should have been subtitled the least of the original book, book ever written. Read. No, nothing in there is my idea. Not one thing. It's all just other people's ideas collected. So, so yeah, you yeah. give it like far too much credit my way. Uh, so anyway, um, um, the, in terms of how my practice has changed, changed, the last couple of years, but very much, uh, almost entirely over the last year, I focused in the work I've been, I, I did at uh, my school I've just left. Um, I focused particularly on teacher development and curriculum development. That was kind of the role that I had. Very large school by primary standards, so I had the opportunity to do that. Um, and you can only really, I think, make really significant changes in places where you accept that what you've done before wasn't particularly great. And that is definitely the case. In um, I, When I look back to the teacher development stuff that I did two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, I, I like to think I did a good version of something that was not particularly advisable. Lots of teacher development stuff, lots of CPD that was... Here's a staff meeting, here's a set of ideas, here's something you need to know, perhaps. Go and try this in the classroom and maybe we'll talk about it later. And, and that was about as good as it got. Um, whereas now I've really tried to make sure that, building on what someone said earlier about this idea of taking your time, about perhaps take, looking at just one priority and focus, focusing on that for a while, um, thinking about the motivation involved, making sure that every teacher is aware that when we're doing a bit of CPD that we are looking to solve a problem that we all share across the school. Um, making sure that everything that I do in CPD explicitly builds on prior knowledge. Making sure that there's um, 
practice involved, lots of decent practice. It, firstly, kind of in a um, almost isolated context and then within something that is going to apply to their teaching the next day or the next week. Um, and making sure that there's a sense of accountability for the teachers and for me when it comes to that professional development. That's stuff that has completely changed uh, in how I do things. And I, I like to think uh, for the better. In terms of like curriculum development, I would say the last year in particular, I've learned that the making and designing and basically the bit of curriculum that you get to do on your computer and where you maybe go and have discussions with teachers and you see what they are doing currently and then you feel like you're building something that is at most 20 percent of the job of curriculum development the 80 percent that comes after that which is okay how does this look in the classroom how am i supporting teachers subject knowledge how am i uh, making sure that the curriculum then adapts to the potential issues with subject knowledge etc that yeah, learning that that eighty percent is is there, and it's what it, it matters as much, if not more, than that first twenty percent has uh, really changed. I mean, just the last thing to note on that, if I may, is that I've kind of reached the point where I think that a lot of the, particularly for a primary level, a lot of this discussions that happen on Twitter about curriculum that, that can become a bit theoretical and navel gazy. That's not an adjective, but I'm going to use it. They. Um, they're kind of often missing the point, I think, if they're not on some level addressing the elephant in the room, which is teacher subject knowledge, because just of the vast array of subject knowledge that's required. So yeah, focusing on subject knowledge in curriculum development in particular has been a real change as well. Nice. I think we should probably make that one of our chats in the next couple of weeks, the 80%, you know, that of, of, of curriculum design. Yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, bookmark that one for a, Tuesday night in the in the very very near future so the next few are completely opinion based you know because I think you know I was talking about Pepsi McCrane he was talking about how the golden age of sort of um, of education and how th we've got things better than we've ever had them before in terms of how teachers are developing and growing and things um, and I think we're quite lucky that certainly with the five percent who engage with Twitter and things we get lots of really solid content that help us grow as practitioners. Um, and so by asking the questions that I'm going to, it's not my aim to sort of present a finite number of contributors. It's to think about, you know, these, these just happen to be the people who stand out to us, you know. So the, the first one is sort of the breakout contributor, someone who you hadn't necessarily read or heard from before this year, but actually they've really sort of helped you develop your thinking and help you think deeply about education you know i've gone around the houses and explained that but basically it's, i'm not i'm not trying to say oh these are the absolute best and um, these are just our opinions you know more or less um yeah so elliot do you want to start who's your stand your your breakout contributor this year to the the general education conversation yeah for me it would be um tom oakley on the discord um so we've got the tip uh, thinking deeply about primary education discord where we share like papers that we're reading and blogs that we've written and we just uh, we suggest episodes and we have just general discussion and he's been somebody who's been quite um, present on there uh, which has helped me to constantly go back and engage for it and read through different comments and he's also shared some of his blogs that i've read um, and he's somebody who i'd never engaged with or seen on twitter before um so yeah he would be my breakout contributor this year yeah, he made some fantastic playlists as well with things like stuff from Bernie West to Cotton, different maths sort of sources. And yeah, and definitely I, I sit and, you know, YouTube just sort of lets you watch the next video. So you can, you can spend hours just sort of geeking out on that kind of stuff. Shannon, what about you? Who's your breakout contributor? Mine, this was the easiest one for me. Mine has to be Tom Brassington, who is at Brasso Teach on Twitter. Um, He's been on Twitter for a bit before and we, we've interacted, but this year I feel like he's um, just really upped his Twitter game. Like the, the threads he posts, they're so thoughtful and well-considered. And he talks about so many areas, you know, I can't remember if it was yesterday or the day before, he talked about Westminster Abbey, one of his favourite places. And so he's just done this beautiful thread that where you can just sit and read and go, oh, I didn't know that. And that's... What a beautiful thing to do. And, you know, the day before it was sculpture, 
he's got a unit on sculpture coming up and people were sharing their sculptures that they're their favorite sculptures and he's one of those people that pulls everyone on twitter together and you start to have these really interesting conversations that he's kind of um instigated and you know i think lead, he's leading geography this year and his threads on that have just been so fascinating and he is also just one of the funniest people we met him at the Research Ed National and he was just an absolute joy to spend the day with and I'm so so glad we met him because he is 100% one of my favorite people to go and look at on Twitter and if it's if it's you know there are a few accounts who will go onto their profile and just see what they've tweeted recently and he is 100% one of them. Yeah, I think way back in like maybe January or February, he retweeted one of the podcast episodes because I'd never, never heard of him before. And then, you know, since then, it's just been content, 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 you know, both on the Discord and on, on Twitter, you know, and I'm thinking about, you know, particularly his thoughts on mental health and geography. Those have really stood out to me as things that have been really worthwhile. And like you say, nice threads that you can sort of engage with, you know, not not quite a blog, but worthy enough of a, of a nice Twitter thread, which seems to be the sort of the thing to do these days you know it's certainly the way most people seem to be taking on their their content chris what about you do you have a breakout contributor i don't know about whether he'll appreciate me describing as a breakout contributor as he, i'm sure he's been on um twitter probably longer than i have um but ryan Leishon, his every couple of weeks i'll go on to uh, I'll, I'll just happen to notice a thread which has he has begun, he will have asked an interesting question. And then when people have answered, he will have, you know, come up with kind of relatively provocative, but politely provocative responses in order to keep the conversation going. I would say this year, there's been kind of 10, 12 occasions, at least where a fascinating conversation about reading where I've come away learning things from people who know much more than I do, has been started by him. And that's not an accident. It's the fact that he is constantly thinking about, um, well, literacy more generally, but uh, thinking about reading. So I, I think I've done it twice already on Twitter where I've just said, follow this man, um, but I'll do it again. Yeah, follow Ryan. Yeah, that's Ryan R. Or Ryan, I apologise for the pronunciation. This is the joy of only knowing people on Twitter. R-Y-O-N, um, L-E-Y-S-H-O-N, Ryan Leishon. It, brilliant. You know, highly recommended follow. Yeah, I think everyone around here will will, ag will agree with that, um, and definitely someone who I would love to have the chance to sit down and chat with on the on the podcast. But I know he's got a very very young family. Certainly, the last time I was speaking to him um, via direct message, he was either expecting or had just had um, uh, a baby. So, um, you know, completely understandable that it's, uh, you know maybe one for the future in a couple of years' time. But uh, yeah, um, and then last but not least, Neil, what about yourself? You're on mute. It's going to happen. So this year, I particularly enjoyed the content uh, and the blogs by uh, Nick Hart, who is a, a head teacher around the, the the Reading area, I believe. I think he's um, posted some very interesting, uh, interesting things that have been exceptionally useful to me as I'm just starting my uh, my leadership journey. It's not so I've agreed with um, again everything that he's said um but again that that's that's healthy to to disagree and yeah i think it's always been uh useful when you're doing um pupil progress or thinking about development uh he there's normally a blog that he's written about it so it's definitely a, it's been a worthwhile one to kind of read just before um i've gone on to do those things to just have a look and see how that's all been done so yeah really recommend that you follow nick hart on twitter yeah, his stuff's always really, really clear, you know, and I appreciate that when I'm tired and I want to, but I still want to learn something. And you read his blogs and you think, oh, yes, I understand this better than I did before I, before I read it. I think, um, yeah, he's in, involved with them. Um, is it research in Hertfordshire? My, my knowledge of English counties isn't great, you know, but I'm thinking M40, <laughs> M40 direction. <laughs> Berkshire? Yeah, Berkshire. Yeah. Yeah, Berkshire. Um, which is, I think that's May next year, you know. Is Berkshire nearly M40? Well, I suppose we'll never know, will we? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not necessarily that important. Um, I, I almost feel horrible asking the next one, but um, who's, who do you think has been the most valuable contributor? You know, and again, this is highly subjective. 
um, the opinion of those who are responding. Um, Chris, I'm going to go to you this time. Who do you think has given the most valuable contribution in 2021? I've got so many names written down, <laughs> but I've already broken the rule once, so I'm not going to break it this time. I am just going to stick with um, one person, but I'm, I'm, I'm almost deciding. On no, I, I have to go with this person. Um, Sam Friedman, on at least two or three occasions, uh, about I've been sitting on my phone, just killing some time, you know, late in the day, 11, 12 o'clock, maybe I can't sleep. And I found a thread that he's written about politics or a thread that he's written about um, the, the economics of South Africa, or he, I found a thread that he's written about international test cricket or whatever it might be. And he seems to have been, he's like a bot designed to interest me with what he creates. It's, he's absolutely wonderful content. I think at one point, I think a couple of weeks back, I was going to say, you know, my fate, you know, my fate, apart from the friends that I've made on Twitter, basically you guys, Apart from the friends that I've made on Twitter, the best thing about Edgy Twitter is Sam Friedman. I thought, hang on a minute, if I'm posting this at midnight, it's going to seem a bit creepy. I'm not going to do that. So I've got that saved somewhere and never posted it. But yeah, he is um, for big picture stuff, for politics, for all sorts of things. I think his contribution to Edgy Twitter is it, it, it deserves to be more appreciated than it probably is. It's yeah, he's fantastic. Yeah, definitely with you. And um, yeah, and he, he sort of seems to go with, he's got his he's got his view of education and that's it, no matter who he's speaking to. And I, I really respect that, you know, because then, um, yeah, it's, it's not an easy job, but he, he's definitely, I think, for the betterment of the profession in general. So nice, I, I agree with that. What about you, Shannon? Well, like Chris, there are lots of names that I could have said and I've just changed my mind at the last minute um, because... There are just so many people that that I find valuable and who bring such goodness to, to Edgy Twitter. But the one I've chosen is Catherine Morgan. Catherine is, I think, really underrated. And she, you know, she used to be a primary teacher. She has changed. She's, you know, um, she worked for um, she worked for Teach Development Trust. Well, who am I? Yep, thank you, Neil. Um, but she she points you in the direction of so many papers and books and quotes. And she's one of those people who ha appears to have read everything because she, kno she knows so much. And we had a, um, a really intimate uh, talk with her and Peps at Research Ed, Surrey. And um, it was sort of, I think nine of us in a room and it was because they'd agreed to do a last minute session where someone had canceled. And her thoughts on things and the way that she, um, the way that she kind of reflects on things is just incredible and for me uh, you know as a woman in education I think she's a, a really good example of someone that I look up to um and she kind of like brings research together and she pulls everything together for you so she's sort of doing the work for you which I think is always handy yeah, I totally agree. And she's always been really supportive of the podcast as well. I think one of her collections is um, places to go to listen to um, things about education. She's certainly, you know, so obviously a big thank you to her for, for her support and um, in sharing our message. Elliot, who do you think has provided the most value to your professional development this year? I think mine would be um, Josh Goodrich and his um, four-part blog on instructional coaching. Um, which is a great read. He's clearly very knowledgeable about the subject and very um, well read on it. Um, and he also presents presents CPD how it should be in small parts, easy to follow, um, sort of actionable content framed um, within like a school example. Like he, he makes up sort of like fictitious leader and puts them in different situations, shows what a dialogue would look like between them as a coach and, and whoever they're, they're coaching. Um, there's a particularly useful part of the blog, which was about... Um, the, the sort of differences between coaching novices and experts um, sort of like the goals that we set people, how do we model to people and how do, how do we give feedback? Um, yeah, incredibly useful. And I know um, I don't want to speak on behalf of Lloyd, but I, I spoke to him about it at the time. And I remember him finding them really useful as well. So yeah, definitely go and check those out. Brilliant. And then Neil. My breakout contributor is uh Johnny Hall, who's the creator of uh, MathSpot, just because over the last kind of 
eight to 12 weeks. Um, he's put a lot of work into uh, upgrading uh, some of the feature sets of MathSpot, which has made it far more usable uh, in the classroom. And he did all of this kind of while on paternity leave, I believe. That's when he had a good uh, two, three week kind of uh, window to actually do stuff. So yeah, very impressed that he was able to find the time during uh, what is, you know, a, what I'm sure would be a, a incredibly wonderful time to actually do those maths um, bot upgrades. Um, so much so that um, it's def I, um he has a Patreon if you want to support him and it's definitely worth the, the three pound or two pound 95 um, that I give him a month to support that website just because it has been, it's just an absolute treasure trove. I still haven't really, uh, used it to its full extent yet. Yeah, it's great for the virtual manipulatives. And I look at that and I've lost track of the amount of times as a teacher. I was trying to find, um, you know, really useful um, like analog clock templates on various websites and he's got it all there sorted as printouts already. Uh, yeah, it's a really, really useful uh, website for any teacher of mathematics, whether you're in uh, early years, because I know he does some um, uh, I believe actually from the conversations uh, from uh, that he's had with yourselves and from listening to the podcast, he's now got some supervising in there as well, which is great. So, and it's something that I've passed on to our uh, reception year one teachers as well. Yeah, just a fantastic site full of mathematical goodness, really. And he's producing now little um, videos. I think he's got something like 137 things that it can do and he's now on his way to actually um, you know make many uh, videos on how to get the most out of those so I'm really looking forward to um, the rest of those I think he's only done about two or three right now but I'm looking forward to the rest of that coming out in the 2022 and really maximizing the use of the use of it yeah if, if he put that content you know the the videos on how to use the resources behind his patreon he could retire next year you know, because they're going to be extremely valuable to people. And, um, you know, and, and you know, what, what do we get? We get some um, ad free password, you know, um, for, for our patronage, you know, potentially a bit of an inflammatory password choice this month, you know, for December. But, um, you know, we'll probably have to have a conversation with them about, uh, about team units in the, in the near future. But uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, Johnny's um, contribution to maths, you know, he deserves a knighthood for it at the very least, you know, because, you know, where would we be? if we didn't have math spot you know i think i think there are a lot of teachers who, who you know particularly when the opportunity cost of we don't have enough resources is in full swing well i'm going to use math spot because it's it's pretty interactive and every day it does something different you know so it's, it's absolutely fantastic so i'm with you there um so then moving on to looking at 2022 i see you guys have got quite a lot of names on the, on the on your notes for this next one who would you like to see on the podcast in 2022? Instead of me jumping in and saying, I think if we just sort of go around the, you know, it's like a Shannon, Elliot, Christopher, and Neil, we just sort of go around that then, that, 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 who would you like to see? And, and obviously why you might want to see them on the on the podcast too. So do you want to start off, Shannon? Who would you like to see in 2022? Right. So there are obviously loads of people that I could have listed, but I got three because everyone else seemed to put three as well. So I thought three was the done thing. Um, the first one would be Nimish Lad, uh, who wrote about the Marge model of learning in action um, book, which I am yet to read, but I think from what I've heard is a very good book. Um, and Nimish is just great. And he's stepped up to a new role recently. And I think um, he'd be a really fascinating guest to have. We had lunch with him last summer. And um, he's just a really interesting, knowledgeable, clever cookie. Um, my second one I'd love to see would be Kate Overidge talk about leadership. She's had such an interesting career and obviously I'm biased because she is one of my friends, but I know all of her, her stories and I know her kind of values and her beliefs. And I think that she is, um, she's a really interesting leader. Um, and then my last one would be Sarah Farrell, who I think is quite quiet, um, on Twitter. She does that daily maths puzzle. Uh, and she's a, a kind of newish maths lead and she teaches year five. She spoke at New Voices this year. Um, and I just would well, love to know more about her because I don't know much about her. And I think that, you know, she she's probably got quite an interesting journey and um, she has an adorable child. 
So, you know, that always gets a win for me. She'd be a really interesting one to have with Morgs just because she goes through that process of designing these tasks and puzzles daily. So it'd be really interesting to have a, and I agree, I think she's got lots, um, her Dropbox is a treasure trove of mathematical resources as well, which are well worth anyone looking at. So I think there's probably two episodes there with Sarah, one by herself and her journey so far, but then I'd really love to hear that conversation between herself and Morgs as they go through um, task design as well you know that'd be really interesting we've lost Kieran and Aza um so I'll go, I'll go through mine um I'm not as perhaps as active on Twitter as others maybe so I struggled to think for this question um and I'm looking at the list of names and I, I agree with all of them wish I'd thought them myself but the one that came to mind uh, it was Mr. T does history. And I know that there was perhaps a conversation in the works already um, and that that will come in due course. But he, he obviously creates lo loads of lovely threads and blogs about history. Um, and then I know I mentioned him earlier, but um, Ollie Cav and um, David Goodwin, just because I would love to hear them talk specifically about the primary age. So I'm... Sorry for those of you listening at home that the episode has cut out there. They've seen on the recording 10 minutes has disappeared in which we explored what our goals are for 2022 and what we hope to achieve in the coming year. I hope that you have a fantastic start to the year and that you achieve your goals as we go forward. So all this left says until next time. Thanks for listening. Hello there, I'm Lemmy. And this is my favourite YouTube channel.